So the uh, hour of one o'clock having passed, it's now 104. I'm going to call to order the select committee or the subcommittee on legislative process reform. And I don't think I need to repeat this, but I will. This committee is meeting under house rule 10.01 and the clerk will take the roll. Palowski. Here. Wolgamot. Present. Doubt. Present. Freiburg. Present. Garofalo. Present. Haley. Present. Liz Lagarde. Present. Moran. Moran. O'Neill. Present. Pinto. Present. Sandstead. Present. A quorum is present. Thank you, members. Uh, the first thing on the agenda, we're going to have a review from House Research on an overview of the Chapter 12 statute. Uh, Colby Sullivan is going to do the review. I'm going to ask that members hold questions until after each presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. So Mr. Sullivan, would welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and then begin. Hello, Mr. Chair and members. I am Colby Sullivan with the nonpartisan House Research Department. And if Mr. Wirth would uh, put up the PowerPoint presentation, thank you. I prepared a few slides for the committee on um, the governor's emergency powers under Minnesota statutes, chapter 12. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, cover three main topics. I'll highlight some of the key provisions in chapter 12. And I'll talk a bit about the history of uh, the different laws that legislature has enacted over time, resulting in the governor's current set of emergency powers. And at the end then, there will be time for questions. Um, I'm available for questions and there are other staff on the call as well, depending on what members are interested in. So I'll start out my overview of chapter 12 and start in the very beginning of chapter 12. There are a lot of uh, words on this slide, but I wanted to give uh, members a feel for the intent as expressed by the legislature, uh, first in the early 1950s, but retained with a few modifications to this day. And in part, the policy declaration for chapter 12 states that because of the existing and increasing possibility of the occurrence of natural and other disasters of major size and destructiveness. And in order to ensure that the state is adequately prepared to protect public health, peace and safety, and to preserve the lives and property of the people of the state, the legislature finds and declares it necessary to confer upon the governor and local units of government, the emergency and disaster powers provided in chapter 12. So under chapter 12, there are two main categories of emergency that a governor may declare. The first is a national security emergency. And the law provides that this may be declared when the federal government indicates the imminence of a national security emergency or a major Minnesota disaster from enemy sabotage or other hostile action. The second category is the peacetime emergency, which is the main focus of this presentation. The law authorizes the governor to declare a peacetime emergency when an act of nature, a technological failure or malfunction, a terrorist incident, an industrial accident, a hazardous materials accident, or a civil disturbance endangers life and property and local government resources are inadequate to handle the situation. For a peacetime emergency, uh, the legislature has provided that uh, they're limited in duration to five days unless extended by the executive council for up to 30 days. The executive council is comprised of the state's constitutional officers, the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and state audit. When declaring a peacetime emergency, the law requires the governor to immediately notify House and Senate majority and minority party leaders and to give the declaration prompt and general publicity and file it with the Secretary of State. Chapter 12 also prescribes a role for the legislature. Uh, if the governor determines 
the need to extend a peacetime emergency beyond 30 days and the legislature is not already in session, the governor must immediately call a special session of the legislature. By a majority vote of both the House and the Senate, the legislature may terminate a peacetime emergency that extends beyond 30 days. And the law provides uh, explicitly that the legislature's ability to end a peacetime emergency does not limit the governor's authority under other law in the Constitution to have control and command over the Minnesota National Guard. Next slide, please. So within chapter 12 then, when the governor has declared an emergency, that invokes certain emergency powers for the duration of the emergency. And there are a number of them that I'll, I'll go through in the following slides. I haven't listed, or I won't cover every emergency power uh, because some are relatively minor and uh, not as relevant to the current COVID-19 emergency. But I'll hit on, on, I think, the most significant ones. And the first one I'll highlight is the power to cooperate with the federal government and other states in matters pertaining to emergency management including the direction and control of citizens and others in the state, including their entrance or exit from any stricken or threatened public place, as well as facility occupancy, direction and control of public meetings or gatherings, the evacuation, reception, and sheltering of persons, and the movement of pedestrians and all forms of public and private transportation. Chapter 12 also authorizes the governor to require any person, except for members of the military and officers of the state or local units of government to perform emergency management services. Governor may commandeer for emergency management purposes, private property, such as motor vehicles, tools, appliances, medical supplies, other personal property and any facilities with prompt compensation required. A governor may order temporary care facilities to care for seriously ill or injured persons if their regional hospital system is overwhelmed. Acting through the Department of Health, the governor may also, during an emergency, order a person who refuses treatment, testing, or vaccination into isolation or quarantine. The governor may authorize the Department of Education to alter school schedules, curtail school activities, or order schools closed. The governor may also transfer the direction, personnel, or functions of state agencies as necessary to perform or facilitate emergency response and recovery. The governor may request aid from professionals who are licensed in another state or Canada with corresponding Minnesota license requirements waived while the person is rendering aid. So for example, a governor could request aid from medical professionals licensed in a neighboring state and they would not be required to have a Minnesota license to practice while they're rendering aid in the state. The last slide on emergency powers, the final four I'll discuss here. Uh, the legislature has authorized the governor during an emergency to um, skip time consuming procedures and formalities. That's the language directly from the law and um, incur and enter into contracts and incur obligations that the governor believes are necessary to protect the health and safety of persons and the safety of property or to provide emergency assistance to victims. The governor may direct the safe disposition of dead human bodies as reasonable and necessary for emergency response, as well as limit visitations and funerals due to public health risks. The governor may alter or adjust the working hours, leave and payroll of executive branch employees conforming to applicable state laws, rules, and CBAs, collective bargaining agreements, to the extent practicable. And finally, during an emergency, the governor may require local emergency, emergency management agencies to execute and enforce the governor's orders and rules. So in order to carry out the, the powers I've just described, the legislature has authorized the governor during an emergency to make, amend, and rescind executive orders and rules that are necessary to carry out the provisions of Chapter 12 without going through the formal rulemaking process that wouldn't normally be required outside of an emergency. The law provides further that these orders and rules issued by the governor have the full force and effect of law during the emergency if they are approved by the Executive Council and filed with the Secretary of State. 
finally, the law provides that during the, during the period of the emergency, any inconsistent agency rule or local ordinance is suspended uh, to the extent that the emergency exists. Finally, uh, in chapter 12, there's a default criminal penalty. The language provides that unless a different penalty or punishment is specifically prescribed, a person who willfully violates a provision of chapter 12 or a rule or order having the force and effect of law and issued by the governor under authority of chapter 12 is guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction punishable by a fine not to exceed $1,000 or imprisonment for not more than 90 days. So in the final part of the presentation here, I wanna highlight just a few of the significant laws that the legislature has enacted over time. Next slide, please, thank you. Starting in 1951 with the Minnesota Civil Defense Act. <clears throat> and according to my research, um, after the Soviet Union successfully detonated a nuclear weapon, the United States Congress enacted the Federal Civil Defense Act of 1950 and that federal act provide for shared, provided for shared responsibility for civil defense among the federal government, state governments, and local units of government, recognizing that with the development of um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, America's adversaries might not assemble for an invasion at the nation's borders where the US military could respond, but could instead initiate a war by launching a, a missile into the country's interior where states and local governments would be the first to respond. So after Congress took the step of passing that federal act, the following year in 1951, Minnesota lawmakers enacted the corresponding state law, the Minnesota Civil Defense Act, 1951. And among other things, the state law declared that in order to provide for the common defense and protect the public peace, health and safety. So this, is, this first item is basically the the purpose statement that I read to you earlier, uh, it dates back to the Civil Defense Act of 1951. The act also authorized the governor to declare a civil defense emergency that could last up to 30 days and only in the event of an actual attack on the United States or a major disaster from enemy sabotage or other hostile action. This is the precursor to today's national security emergency that's still in law. Uh, this was the origin of the governor's authority, in this case, only during a civil defense emergency to make, amend, and rescind orders and rules that have the force and effect of law with the suspension of any conflicting agency rules or local ordinances. And the, finally, the Civil Defense Act required the governor, if the legislature was not already in session, to immediately convene the House and Senate when declaring a civil defense emergency. Jumping ahead a couple of decades to 1979, um, in, according to my research, it was in um, 79 that the legislature authorized the governor for the first time to declare a peacetime emergency. And although I've looked, it's not clear to me what prompted the legislature to authorize the peacetime emergency. Uh, working with the excellent staff in our legislative reference library, the only historical clue that we could find was a brief 1979 newspaper article that quickly described the bill and said it was likely to pass the House with little or no debate. And that, that may be because the, the effect of declaring a peacetime emergency in 1979 was, um, in, in my opinion, significantly more limited than it is today. The, the law said the governor could declare a peacetime emergency uh, when an act of nature, industrial accident, or hazardous materials accident endangers life and property, and local government resources are inadequate. And the effect was that when declaring a peacetime emergency, it would essentially invoke uh, specific aspects of the state's civil defense plan, particularly the response and recovery aspects, as well as authorizing the governor to award aid, presumably to local units of government. And 1979 was the origin of uh, the language that exists to this day that limits the duration of a peacetime emergency to five days unless extended by the Executive Council. Moving on to 1996, there was significant uh, modernization of Chapter 12 
And so much so that the legislature renamed Chapter 12 at that time, the Minnesota Emergency Management Act of 1996, after the, the law that changed it significantly. Um, among other things, the 1996 law changed uh, Minnesota statute Chapter 12 language and programs to sort of broaden and expressly address emergencies generally, including natural disasters. It looks like it may have been an effort to align state programs with uh, federal aid programs through the Federal Emergency Management Agency so that the state would be well positioned to apply for and receive federal aid through FEMA. The legislature at that time changed the name of the Civil Defense Emergency to its current name, the National Security Emergency, and added civil disturbance to the list of events for which a governor could declare a peacetime emergency. Next in 1999, uh, in preparation for the new millennium and potential computer or other problems attributable to Y2K, the legislature amended chapter 12 again, this time adding additional events which would authorize the governor to declare a peacetime emergency. Those events being a technological failure or malfunction as well as a terrorist incident. The next event, um, in 2002, and there were significant changes to Chapter 12 as part of the Minnesota Emergency Health Powers Act. And it was after the terrorist incidents of September 11, 2001, were followed by an anthrax public health scare. According to my research, the Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Health, proposed a new state law based on a model state emergency health powers act that was prepared by the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and after significant debate in the legislature and many committee hearings and amendments, the legislature enacted the Minnesota Emergency Health Powers Act in 2002. But I think due in part to the controversy at the time, um, the legislature required a report uh, that would help the legislature gather additional information and set a sunset date of two years out, 2004, so that the legislature could revisit the law at that time. So among other things, the Health Powers Act created a new public health emergency and authorized the governor to declare either a national security emergency or a peacetime emergency in response to a public health emergency. This is when the governor was given the power to restrict entrance or exit from any stricken or threatened public place, as well as uh, occupancy of facilities and all forms of public and private transportation. Uh, I think also due to maybe some uh, reservations among at least some of members of the legislature, uh, there were a couple of, um, or at least one or two guardrails that were put in, one that provided that an emergency declared due to a public health emergency would automatically terminate 30 days after de declaration unless renewed by the governor. Um, importantly, the legislature in 2002 provided that uh, the governor's orders and rules that are issued during a peacetime emergency declared due to a public health emergency would have the force and effect of law. And according to my research, this is the first time that a governor was able to issue orders and rules with the force and effect of law during a peacetime emergency. But in this case, the legislature said that that could only happen if the peacetime emergency was declared due to a public health emergency. The yeah, act did some other important things. It um, is the origin of some other powers that the governor has to this day, including uh, compelling participation in emergency management, commandeering personal property and facilities, directing dead body disposition, limiting funerals and visitations. Um, it required the governor when declaring or renewing a peacetime emergency due to a public health emergency to call the legislature into session at that time as well as uh, require the governor to notify not only House and Senate leadership, but also the chairs and ranking minority members of certain House committees and to provide them with information about how this emergency may impact the public. And uh, this 2002 law is the origin of the provision that remains to this day, authorizing the legislature to terminate um, a peacetime emergency, at that time just a public health emergency at any time by a majority vote of each body. And the final um, item to discuss, it was in 2005. And um, 
After the legislature acted in 2004 to extend the 2002 public health law by one additional year, in 2005, the legislature enacted two laws that effectively retained portions of the 2002 law, modified some others, and allowed many of them to expire. And according to my research, as recommended by the Minnesota Department of Health at that time, the legislature allowed the separate public health emergency statutes to expire. And having listened to the tapes from that era, um, it was House Chief Author Representative Duke Powell's stated intent that because emergencies have a public, because many different emergencies would have a public health component, the state would be better served by eliminating the separate public health emergency protocols and going forward, responding instead to public health and all other emergencies under a uniform all hazards approach in chapter 12. So to accomplish that, the legislature uh, repealed references to the public health emergency or simply allowed them to expire. Some of the pieces the legislature retained inclu included the provision that authorized the legislature to end any peacetime emergency by a majority vote if it extends beyond 30 days. Remember previously in 2002, that applied only in the event that the governor declared a peacetime emergency due to a public health emergency. But as of 2005, the legislature's authority applies to all peacetime emergencies declared by the governor. They extend beyond 30 days. And then similarly, the 2002 language was retained that required the governor to call a special session if extending a peacetime emergency beyond 30 days. And then um, significantly, the last bullet point is that in 2005, as part of this all hazards approach, the legislature for the first time authorized the governor to exercise the chapter 12 emergency powers and issue orders and rules that have the full force and effect of law during any peacetime emergency, regardless of uh, the purpose for which it was called or declared in the first place. That's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, if members have questions, I or others will we'll try to answer them. Uh, members, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Are there any questions, members? Yes, hi, um, Mr. Chair. Representative Moran. How you doing? Um, what I'm here. But two, uh, can we get a copy of this? Representative Moran, I, I believe these were sent to us, but they uh, we will certainly send it if you didn't get it. So you'll get a copy of it. All right, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a, a really interesting history. It's something that I was wondering about how all of this came to be. Um, I still have a question because it, it seems like we're still not following chapter 12 exactly as it is today. And my question is the majority vote part. It's something that my constituents have asked me repeatedly. It says clearly that a major, majority vote of the House, majority vote of the Senate is enough to stop and end the emergency powers. Um, and yet in the House, at close to 10 times, we've had to, uh, not quite 10, maybe seven times now, we've had to uh, achieve a 90 or a 90 vote, which is a two thirds majority to suspend the rules to get to the, um, the ability to do a majority vote. And can you, and they don't do that in the Senate, the Senate just goes straight to a majority vote. Can you tell me why that is? Uh, why is it that we're not following chapter 12 according to what's written here and what you just described with a simple majority vote of 68 votes to end the peacetime emergency? And I do have a follow-up after that too. Uh, Mr. Sure. Chair, would you like me to ask that now or do you want me to do it? No, why don't we get this one? Let's get this one done and then we'll go to your next one. How's that? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Sullivan, do you wish to respond? Mr. Chair and members, um, the Director of House Research, Patrick McCormick, is on this call as well. And if possible, I'd, I'd like to defer to him to answer that question. Sure. Mr. McCormick. Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill, um, the differences between legislative procedures and a substantive vote on Chapter 12. Legislative procedures allow um, the interposition of um, House rules to require that a resolution or a bill be brought to the floor under, under a condition which in some cases requires a two thirds vote. For example, 
um, if you want to suspend rules and declare an emergency under the Constitution, that requires a two-thirds vote prior to voting on the subsequent motion. Or if you want to bring a bill out of committee. Um, and the House procedures, whether they're um, whether it's a happy matter for you or not, the House procedures allow the majority to interpose the two-thirds vote as a prior step to doing a vote on uh, Chapter 12. Representative O'Neill. Thank you. I actually have a follow-up to that now that he, he said that. All right. um, Mr. McCormick, if you could explain to myself and to the public, um, if it is different now that we are fully in session, uh, then needing the 90 votes or the two-thirds majority to suspend the rules to bring a resolution, are we still under that rule of the House now that we're fully in session, or has that now changed, reverted back to a simple majority? If you could explain that to me and to the public. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Mr. McCormick. Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill, under House rules, a resolution can be brought out of committee or a bill can be brought out of committee with a simple majority. That rule has not been changed. And early in session, we had a vote on whether to bring the resolution ending the governor's peacetime emergency out of committee. If 68 members had voted yes, that would have been brought out of committee and brought to the floor. 68 votes were not there, and so the resolution was not brought out of committee. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McCormick, for that. I know that that is a question that is asked so often, and I, I think the public will appreciate that answer coming from you, Mr. McCormick, that have been there decades uh, as a nonpartisan expert in parliamentary procedure. Okay, now another question actually for Mr. Sullivan, if I might, um, it has to do with the history of this. It, it really has evolved since 1951 when it was first instituted. And the biggest changes seem to me to be the 2002 and 2005 iterations of this. And um, the portion of this that is the most problematic, I think, for us as a legislature to have equal authority and equal power with the legislative branch um, and what the public is the most frustrated with, I might add, is uh, the fact that the governor and the executive branch has been allowed to continue past the 30 days. And as you see through the, the sto this whole iteration of this particular part of statute, Chapter 12, um, that was not extended until 2002. So I, I get it after September 11th, it was the governor could then extend it past 30 days. But let me ask you this, as they were wrap, kind of uh, uh, grasping with this, trying to understand this, and they even did a sunset. Um, there was a decision obviously made that instead of the legislature needing to vote to approve the continuation of the emergency, they have to vote to stop the emergency. And that is a very, very, very different story. Um, you know, Minnesota historically has been a divided government. And so that seems to kind of quelch the minorities voice and power. Um, and I'm just wondering if in your research, you found out why did they do that? Why did the legislature, um, and it was interesting to me as I researched too, that the 2002 change was under um, Ventura. So not a Republican or a Democrat. So um, just wondering if you have any historical background as to why that decision was made. Cause that certainly has become incredibly problematic for the voices of the minority and very, very loud voices of our citizens. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Chair and Representative O'Neill, I listened closely to the tapes of legislative committee hearings, House and Senate, and floor debates in 2005, um, but I have not, uh, but I will, uh, to research your question, go back and find the tapes for 2002, because as you pointed out correctly, that's when the legislature's ability to end a peacetime emergency extending beyond 30 days began. Uh, I know in 2005, that was one of the provisions that was set to expire. And in a House committee, I think it was the Public Safety Committee, I'd have to go back and look, uh, via amendment that was, uh, um, the legislature made sure that that ability to terminate a peacetime emergency was retained as other parts of the 2002 law expired. But I don't know the answer uh, from the tapes to your question of what happened in 2002 and if the legislature, if members of the legislature debated 
how that mechanism should work and what other, what other alternatives existed. But I, I will look into that and I'll, I will get back to members of the committee. Mr. Representative O'Neill. Yep, I uh, just wanna thank you for all of that. Those are my questions, but I, I would point out that uh, these are incredibly problematic things and I, I realize they were debated in the past, but also to point out that um, this has effectively silenced the voice of the minority and very loud voices of the citizens of Minnesota. And it's something that we absolutely have to deal with. This is unacceptable moving forward. I don't know who thought that was a great idea. I could list off the governors and uh, the leaders of the House and the Senate, but you can look it up for yourself and to see what happened in 2002 and 2005. Thank you. Representative McGill, we'll have Mr. Sullivan give a better answer or a fuller answer to you at our next meeting. So after he reviews those tapes. Mr. Chair, Representative, Representative Sandstead. I have no question, Mr. Chair. Okay. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I just wanted to follow up on those questions, Representative O'Neill. Um, the decision to make these changes 2002, 2005, presumably those were approved by legislative majorities uh, at, at the time. So the majority made the decision to do that. Is that, is that right, um, Mr. Sullivan, perhaps uh, Mr. McCormick? Mr. Sullivan or Mr. McCormick, who wants to uh, field that one? Mr. Chair, I, I can take that one and Representative Pinto. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, all of the provisions that I described, all of the changes to chapter 12 were enacted by a majority of both the House and the Senate. And Mr. And Sullivan, just to be clear, you're going to, in our next meeting, you'll do a, an answer to Representative O'Neill. I just want to make sure that you're aware that we're requesting of it. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, um, I, I believe that uh, there was actually a Republican majority in both 2002 and 2005 and the Republican governor in 2005. Am I, am I right about that? Repres Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Chair and members, I... I believe the I believe the House was in a Republican control. I believe um, I'm trying to remember when Governor Plenty was elected. I know he was governor in 2005. Uh, I think he probably was governor in 2002. Others, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure about uh, the majority in the Senate at the time. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I actually, I think I, I, uh, I had in my mind the House majority I, I, as a House partisan, I think, along with many members of the committee, um, the Republican control of the House. I think there probably was a DFL Senate in both those times. And then and then Governor Plenty in 2005, I think Representative O'Neill pointed out, Governor Ventura in 2002. So my apologies, Mr. Chair and members. And I guess then just one other follow-up question. I was concerned in the questioning of, of our House staff um, that there was an implication maybe that Chapter 12 was not being followed in terms of legislative process. I just wanna make sure that um, that there's no um, concern that in the process that's been followed, um, that there's been some violation of chapter 12 by the by the legislature in terms of how it's acted or, or has an act. Just that line about their, you know, the majority vote of each house and may terminate the emergency, et cetera. And I wanna make sure that uh, our house research staff is not aware of some, of some uh, you know, violation or mistake by the, by the house in terms of, in terms of uh, chapter 12. Mr. McCormick or Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Chair, I'm Representative Pinto. No, the, there's nothing in Chapter 12 that mandates a vote of the House and Senate to end the emergency. It's discretionary. The House can choose to have a vote. The Senate can choose to have a vote. And uh, if they don't want to choose to have a vote, that de facto continues the emergency. Thank, thank you for that. And thanks for the really helpful presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Are, are there any other questions on this area? Seeing none, before I move to the next uh, presentation, I wanna draw the members attention to a letter you should have received from Governor Walls. This letter is dated today, January 21st. I'm sorry, yesterday, January 21st. It's to legislative leaders. Um, you might wanna take a look at it. It's in reference to the letter that he sent on January 7th. Uh, the letter does uh, mention the work of this committee and the governor's willingness to uh, work with us now that we are in session. So having that letter in our possession, I'm going to move to the next series of presentations. And the first I have is uh, Assistant Commissioner Dan Huff. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Dan Huff. 
I am an assistant commissioner for health protection at the Minnesota Department of Health. And uh, I'm actually going to be sharing uh, my presentation with my colleagues, uh, Joe Kelly and Cheryl Peterson Krober. Um, and with your permission, Mr. Chair, committee members, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Kelly uh, to start the presentation. Mr. Kelly, welcome to the committee, or Director Kelly, and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Chair Pulowski and members, uh, good afternoon for the record. I'm Joe Kelly, and I serve as the state's emergency management director with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. I, I enjoyed the, uh, and appreciated the excellent overview of Chapter 12 by, uh, by Mr. Sullivan, and that, that good work allows me to keep my remarks very short with the intention of uh, providing some context of the law to the pandemic response that, that we at, at the Department of Public Safety from the State Emergency Operations Center have been supporting for the last 313 days. And uh, Mr. Worth, if you could, would you uh, please uh, put our slides up? Thank you, sir. Um, next slide, please. Uh, specific to peacetime emergencies and emergency powers members, uh, typically uh, emergencies are declared and those authorities are used for actions like activating the National Guard, lifting weight limits uh, on roads to facilitate bringing in materials uh, to build emergency flood protection and even recognizing other states commercial driver's license credentials to get utility crews into the state to help replace poles and restring power lines. And compared to the, the, the full potential heft of the statute, that's, that's pretty modest stuff, particularly if you look back as Mr. Sullivan took us through uh, all the way back to 1951 and the prospect of thermal, thermal nuclear war. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide, I know it's very difficult to read and it's more of the colors than anything, but it illustrates the unprecedented scope of state support to an emergency response. Uh, the center column from about the, the third dark blue block down, as well as those two yellow blocks, uh, represent the temporary leadership structures and work groups that have been needed to support the response and prevent the uncontrolled spread of the virus across Minnesota. The interagency working groups uh, that we are supporting from the State Emergency Operations Center include those for testing, healthcare surge, long-term care support, critical care supplies, education and child care, food security, at-risk populations, community resiliency and recovery, and of course, vaccinations. I have been involved in emergency response and disaster recovery in Minnesota for more than a quarter century. And I have never been part of a mobilization of all levels of government, and certainly nationwide and around the world for an emergency like this one. And it, it strikes me that, that a major incident like this is, is much more uh, the type of event that the writers, the original writers of chapter 12 and those who have amended along the way uh, had that in mind, then some of the more common, uh, admittedly limited, more limited natural disasters that we are all uh, experienced with. Uh, from our perspective in the State Emergency Operations Center, the foundational peacetime emergency declaration uh, provides us uh, with the tools that we need to quote fast provide emergency aid, uh, close quote. And that's what uh, Mr. Sullivan was talking about on his slide where he talked about being able to set aside temporarily some of those time consuming uh, procedures um, because we just need to do things quickly and have the agility to respond effectively. We, we simply can't do what we have needed to do for things like expediting uh, purchases and contracts, hiring temporary workers, redeploying state employees, renting facilities and equipment and effectively managing the money uh, without the peacetime declaration. And I know that that foundational executive order is just one of many that the legislature is interested in. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, subject to any questions at this time, I would turn the presentation back over uh, to Assistant Commissioner Huff. Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is to frame uh, my presentation in our public health data, and specifically this chart here. And I, this chart is uh, new cases per 100,000 people per day 
Uh, and you see we start back in April 1st, uh, and it goes all the way up, uh, uh, up until yesterday. Um, and what we see here is that we, uh, as we know, we, we hit a, a surge in cases in May, uh, and then we were able to, to go along really fairly steadily throughout the summer. And then into fall, we started to increase, and then we hit that fall surge where we became really uh, at crisis levels in, in our healthcare sector, in our hospitals, uh, following the governor's dial back and the excellent work of all of Minnesotans, we have uh, um, turned that uh, surge back to a, a dramatic decline and are a much better place than we were back Thanksgiving. Next slide, please. Our rate of hospitalizations, our rate of uh, uh, hospital admissions tracks to the number of cases we have. It tends to lag. And but it is proportional to that, and that continues. Next slide with our ICU admissions. You'll see that there's a bit of a lag. People are um, tested, they um, are diagnosed, uh, then they may end up in the hospital, and then from there, if they uh, continue to get worse in ICU. Next slide, and you see that deaths and lag behind that. Um, but you can see that all of these correspond. Uh, to the number of cases. It's all proportional. Next slide. If we look at how we have done compared to other states in the Midwest, what we had is Minnesota was a victim of this surge that happened in all of the states surrounding us. But you will see here that our surge is smaller and narrower than most of our neighboring states, specifically the Dakotas. We feel that this is a real indication of the success of Minnesota's uh, COVID response and the emergency declaration under Governor Walz. Um, we uh, uh, wish we could have prevented that surge, but it's very difficult when uh, the sea is rising all around you. There's no such thing as a seawall that you can put around the state of Minnesota to prevent a disease from also spilling over. Next slide, please. What we have here, these each star represents when a state hit 1,000 deaths per, excuse me, one death per hundred, excuse me, one death per thousand people. So if you picture a Vikings game as about a capacity of 66,000 people, that means of those 66 of them die. You can see that we are one of the last states in our region to reach that level of 1,000 deaths, one death per 1,000 people. Next slide, please. As we look at what happened, why did we go? We, we were moving along um, fairly consistently. We, had, uh, uh, we are in what we call a dial phase three, which is a lot of things are open with some restrictions in the state. Um, and then all of a sudden we started to tick upwards and you can see what happens with exponential growth. This is the challenge when we work with an infectious disease is that an infectious disease tends to grow slowly and then it hits a tipping point where you have enough people in the population that are infected and that then can spread the disease to other people who can spread it to other people that you hit this exponential growth curve. And you can see that we were at uh, 15 cases per 100,000 people um, there just after June, September, uh, what is it, about September 16th, we hit that. And then if you look on October 5th, it took us three weeks to get up to 20 cases per 100,000. And then two weeks later, we were at 30 cases. And then two weeks later, we were up over 100 cases per 100,000, that is when we hit exponential growth. At the levels that we are, exponential growth can tip on a dime. And that is why it is so important that we maintain vigilance, maintain these executive authority and these emergency powers to uh, change with and pivot as the virus changes so quickly. Next slide, please. Show this slide, the virus changes over time. So this is just different weeks up into our current week, which is uh, 
um, week one for the MMWR, our most recent week that's uh, posted. Uh, you can see the darker blue represents higher case counts per county and the virus changes. It moves over time. Another thing that's important to note about here, there's, there tends to be a, a popular misnomer that the metro is where we have more severe disease. And that's just not the case. And it has not been the case for many months. The more severe counties impacted have been outstate counties, um, primarily in the western and southern portions of our state. But as you can see, it has moved around to where it has impacted every single county in our state. This is truly a statewide emergency. Next slide. COVID is a serious disease. You've probably heard of the term uh, COVID long haulers. Um, it, it's an interesting disease. It attacks or attaches to ACE2 receptors on our cells. We happen to have this type of receptor in many of our cells. They concentrate on our lungs and our respiratory system. That is why COVID is predominantly a respiratory disease. However, we have ACE2 receptors in our nervous tissue, in our brains. We have them in our cardiovascular system, and we have them in our heart. And that is why we have seen an increase in uh, cardiac arrests, heart attacks, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, encephalitis. Um, uh, and then just sort of very interesting things such as COVID toes, which is a, uh, it's a cardiovascular effect um, where the virus is attacking this cardiovascular lining within our, our toes even. But that impacts the kidneys, um, and uh, uh, also, in rare cases, pro provides an uh, inflammatory disease in young children. Next slide, please. So going back to my, my original slide, where you see that as cases rise, we also increase hospitalizations and ultimately death. It is proportional. We are right now at about 26 cases per 100,000 people. If we were at 30, cases per 100,000 people, we estimate then on the percentage of people that, that are impacted that we would see 170 Minnesotans die every week. If we were to increase to 150 cases per 100,000, and at our peak, we had 120, we would see 850 Minnesotans die in a week. Conversely, if we were able to go down back to closer where we were this summer to 10 cases per 100,000, we would only see still tragically, but much fewer 60 deaths per week of Minnesotans. The lower we get our cases, the fewer people die, the fewer people are in the hospital. Next slide. We have, and have been tracking for many months now, one of the, the, the guideposts of Minnesota's response is transparency. And we at MDH have stri strived to provide the most transparent and complete data that we can. We've actually been nationally recognized for the completeness and the transparency of our data. But we have developed five uh, public health risk measures that we continue to track. And these five are important because they interrelate with each other. I discussed case growth, but also in that is our testing positivity, our testing rate, because you have to be testing if the other measures um, are still gonna maintain their validity, our hospitalization rate and community spread. That is how many people uh, are infected with the, the disease and do not know where it came from, do not know that personal to person contact just got it somewhere in the community. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, if you look at our, uh, uh, the governor's executive orders, you can see uh, back there in March was when we had our stay at home order. Um, and uh, um, once that stay at home order uh, was really effective and reduced that first spring peak that we had, uh, that was lifted. Um, and we were in this phase three opening really for quite some time. And then in uh, uh, July, that, um, uh, face covering requirement was added for the statewide masking. Um, as we began to see this alarming peak in the fall, uh, the governor instituted uh, first uh, an executive order uh, establishing a curfew in bars and restaurants and some other restrictions. 
and that was followed quickly just because of the perilous place we were at in our hospitals um, with the dial back. Um, and as cases have gone down, uh, the governor issued 2101, which opened up um, and reversed the dial back. Next slide, please. Next slide. One thing to note about our context of how Minnesota has managed this, it is not just driven by one measure. If we were to only focus on the disease, we would limit all social interaction. We would end all interaction outside of the household, except for those in emergency situation. But we know that it is more than just a disease and the track of the disease that governs the health of our state. <clears throat> and so that is why there's been this context approach where we have looked at what is individual and societal well-being and social, mental, physical, emotional health, what is our economic health, as well as how are we controlling the disease? It has been a balance approach of how do we balance listening to the health experts, experts, listening to our economic experts, following the data based upon our knowledge and our science to maintain the balance of Stay Safe Minnesota. Next slide. Stay Safe has some guiding principles. We want to limit morbidity and mortality due to COVID-19. So mortality, that's when people die. But we also have people, as I, we talked about, those long haulers and those other effects of, of COVID. Um, that's where we have morbidity, where many people have been severely impacted by the disease. We want to protect hospital capacity. We must have hospital bed space for people who need it, whether because they slip and fall on the ice or because they have COVID. And we want to make sure that businesses are as open as possible. Uh, it is this balance, however, that has been um, uh, tricky. No one would have wished we were had to do what we did this last year. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic um, has created uh, this unprecedented public health emergency. Um, and under under uh, girding all of this, imbued within all of this, is a focus on equity. And how are we making sure? that we are not exacerbating current inequities and that we are looking at disparities. Next slide. Um, when we look at anything that is, uh, um, uh, how do we control the disease? We look at how the disease is spread. And um, the disease is spread when people are close to each other. How long people are together, the longer people are together, the more likely disease transfer can occur. Um, are people seated? Are they moving? Are they mixing with each other? Those things impact how the disease is able to uh, opportunistically spread to others. Are people masked? We'll talk about masking more in a moment. Um, how are households mixing? If I only stay in my household pod, we have circulated our germs with each other. But if I go with another household, now I'm introducing myself and that other household to a whole new set of germs that we will exchange with each other. COVID may be one of those. And then if we're outdoors or indoors, when we're outdoors, there's greater ventilation, sunlight, that UV radiation uh, destroys the virus, a lot more ventilation moves the virus away from us. It's much safer outdoors than it is indoors. Next slide. As we have gone through this process, we have maintained relationships and maintain a consistent outreach and engagement approach, approach, whether it be Commissioner Grove meeting with different sectors of the economy, uh, Deputy Commissioner Mueller meeting with superintendents and school districts, uh, Minister of Public Health meeting with uh, various sectors, um, meeting uh, um, Commissioner Tomes meeting with uh, uh, youth sports. We have had weekly meetings with various stakeholders throughout the state consistently updating, getting input, seeking advice, addressing questions, making tweaks based upon their input. Next slide. One of the things that we have done, and, and we have worked with our, um, our businesses, our organizations to develop preparedness plans. Um, and they have focused on these categories um, to really get at the heart of how do we control the disease in each of these different settings. Next slide. We have uh, guidance based upon the sector or the venue um, or that type of activity 
on what are the requirements and what are the recommendations for each sector. And it's tailored so that I can go depending on where I fit in and I can find the guidance that meets me, that speaks to my needs. Next slide. Um, we also have continued to provide technical assistance and support. Uh, I talked about the stakeholder engagement we have. We continue that. We've done statewide webinars. Um, we do presentations to member organizations. Um, uh, and we do individual consultation. We at the Department of Health, Department of Education, indeed, we continue to meet one-on-one -on -one with groups or in small groups um, to provide technical assistance to answer questions and help them um, provide a safe environment for their customers, their clients, and their employees. Next slide. So if we look at where is Minnesota? Well, Minnesota is not an outlier here. In all of these, we are actually middle of the pack. So you can see the number of states that have uh, indoor social gathering um, uh, restrictions in place. Next slide. Executive orders gather, governing uh, restaurant and bar service. Next slide. Uh, governing gyms and fitness. Next slide. Or indoor venues, such as the Excel Center or US Bank City. Next slide. The uh, um, face covering mandate, which was implemented in July 25th, we believe has been extremely successful in allowing us to maintain um, both that long run of summer where we'll be able to keep most of things uh, open, uh, moving, moving uh, uh, really at a good place where we did not see increase in, in the disease. Um, and I uh, uh, want to talk to some of the reasons of why this is important. Next slide. First of all, we are by far not an anomaly in being having a mask mandate. The majority of states uh, in the United States do have a mask mandate. Next slide. So if we think about how masks work, we need to think about how the disease spreads. Although the disease can attack cells throughout the body, it is primarily spread through respiratory uh, expectorant. Um, that is, if I breathe out, if I cough, if I sneeze, if I laugh, I sing, I am expelling air from my lungs, and that air is carrying moisture droplets with it. The virus hitches a ride in those droplets. Well, that mask traps the majority of those droplets so that they stay with me and I do not expel them. And those that are expelled don't expel very far because they've used most of their energy just getting through the mask. So what that means is that I am not as likely to spread the disease if I'm infected. The other thing, it actually does provide some filtration effect, so it actually protects me as a wearer as well. We have found that masks are very effective and worldwide this is a very, very common and one of the best mitigation measures employed to um, uh, slow down and prevent COVID transmission. Next slide. It's very much based in the science. Um, uh, just this last year, 25 studies looking at COVID, specifically on COVID, uh, addressing the effectiveness of masking. Um, and CDC has all of these published um, on their website as well. Um, both experimental data that is in the lab, observing how masks work, how aerosols work, as well as our epidemiologic data all support the fact that masking limits the spread of the disease. Next slide. Uh, since we, uh, the governor implemented the masking mandate, you can see that in June 1st, um, although we were, we were encouraging people to use masks, there was a lot of information out there. Um, public pressure to use masks, we were only at 47%. Today, now we're at 77% mask wearing. Uh, the more people wear masks, if we can get to 85 or 90%, that will continue to have an incredible impact on lowering the spread of the disease, saving lives. Next slide. And next slide. And I guess that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Assistant Commissioner Huff, I've got four members who have questions, so I'm going to go to uh, Representative Garofalo first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I want to do an audio check. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, um, 
I just want to make this comment. It's a general comment that pandemics suck, right? <laughs> All the options are bad. They ruin lives, they destroy wealth, and they kill people. And so it's important that, as my understanding of this committee is, is that we're dealing with facts. And we should all recognize that, that there is no silver bullet popular way uh, to get away from this. Uh, there's a lot of um, misinformation and disinformation out there. I view our committee as uh, having a responsibility to avoid that and staying away from the social media vomit that we're seeing partisans uh, proposing. Um, so when it comes to the role of this, co this committee, I guess I don't view it as debating the effectiveness or lack of the effectiveness of the governor's policies. I don't view it as uh, the responsibility of this committee to be comparing us or contrasting us with states that have succeeded, failed, done better or worse than Minnesota. The question before us is that we're in the 11th month of a governor having special powers. And are we okay with that continuing or are we not? It's a simple yes or no question. If, if we're gonna continue to allow one person to make the decisions, then it doesn't really matter whether the decisions are good or bad. That's a secondary issue. The primary issue is whether we're going to whether we're going to have a role in this or whether the governor is going to continue to make those decisions. Um, and so there was um, many things that the commissioner addressed. Uh, I don't want to uh, debate the merits or effectiveness of uh, the policies or compare us to other states. But one of the comments you did make is you said that it was important that the governor um, maintain this authority. And I'm wondering uh, why that is. Assistant Commissioner Huff. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, first of all, thank you for your, your comments there. And I appreciate that um, pandemics do suck. Um, and uh, it's, it gives us with lots of poor choices. I will say that uh, the governor, and I think the governor's letter speaks to itself, the governor is very interested in partnering with the legislature. I think we at the agency, we know that uh, we have our best um, effectiveness when we are able to partner both between the executive and the legislative branches. So I would say that um, uh, I would say that if, if I can amend my statement, what is important is that we have effective response whether that response is through an emergency declaration, through some other type of work, I would say um, what's important is that we continue an effective response to the pandemic. Um, and um, I know I share with my colleagues, I share with the governor, uh, the, the desire to make sure that we do this as collaboratively as possible. So thank you for pointing that out and I'd like to correct that statement, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chair, I, thank you. I think you said it best is that um, the focus needs to be on having an effective response. And there are um, just to kind of, I know there's defined narratives of members and parties. I think it's important to look back at the historical record that back in March, myself and other Republican legislators were actually calling for many of these initiatives to be enacted by the governor back in March when we didn't know what we were dealing with when we were seeing the disasters in Italy and New York and we were feel fearful that was coming here. And so I do think it's important to recognize that there is a desire by many people in my party to be collaborative and work with the governor with the focus that exactly you mentioned there, Commissioner, having an effective response. Now, certainly I can pick apart uh, parts of the governor's decision-making. Uh, some has been effective, some of it's been quite ineffective, but I don't wanna debate that today. Uh, I do want us to have a conversation in this committee about whether we are going to persist under this decision-making model. That is what I view my role as being in this committee. And Commissioner, I want to thank you for, uh, for clarifying your comments. That it's, uh, it's incredibly meaningful. And I know that that means a lot to uh, those, of, those of us on this, uh, on this committee. Thank you. Representative Wolgamott. Thank you, Chair Pulaski. I uh, do have a couple of questions for our testifiers, but before I get into that, I think it's important to remind uh, both members of this committee, but also members of the public who might be watching this, that the state of Minnesota is no outlier in declaring a state of emergency to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. In fact, on the very same day that Governor Walls declared a state of emergency, President Donald Trump 
declared a state of emergency nationally to deal with this pandemic. And all 50 governors, Republican and Democrat alike, have used a peacetime state of emergency to respond to this pandemic. And in fact, Mr. Chair, to this very day, 49 out of the 50 states remain in a state of emergency for the same reasons that we currently are, so that we have the tools and the resources and the flexibility to respond to this pandemic and save Minnesotans' lives. Now to my questions. Uh, my first question is for uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff. Um, Assistant Commissioner Huff, can you tell us more about the MDH decision-making on the most recent dial back in November? Uh, what was the timing like on that decision when we were seeing that surge in cases? Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, we were very concerned about those uh, the cases that we were seeing, and I, I'm wondering if um, if our administrator might be able to go back to slide number eleven, Mr. Worth. So one of the challenges with with an infectious disease is you never know when it's gonna hit exponential spread. Um, we were getting those early, we were getting warning signs. We were starting to increase. Um, and uh, uh, yes, thank you, that's it. Um, so we can see that uh, we started to have a little bit of increase. Now we had had some increases before because things go up and down and up and down. Um, but once we hit that exponential growth there in mid-October, that is when our alarm bells went off. The challenge, of course, is um, there's sometimes a lag between um, how much is already baked in the system. And when you, it's, it's think of a truck going down a, a mountain, when you apply the brakes, it still takes a while to slow down. Knowing that, but knowing that we don't wanna apply the brakes to economic engine, um, too soon, it is a definite balance there. So with our goals of wanting to limit mortality, limit death, but also making sure that the economy is as open as possible, um, we, we first, I guess we, we tapped the brakes with that first executive order, which was the curfew and limiting social um, uh, activities of, uh, you know, how many people we get together on a social basis or weddings and that kind of thing. Um, but we realized that at this point we were going too fast down the hill and had to apply, um, uh, really, really uh, apply in the brakes. And Commissioner Malcolm had a discussion with the governor and said, Governor, I'm, I'm very worried and this is what the data shows us. And um, um, uh, the governor took that here, uh, uh, heeded that warning and, and that was when that uh, dial back was applied. Representative Walgamot. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I may ask one more question of Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Huff. Representative Walgamot. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff, you, you sort of mentioned that balance between the economy and saving lives. Now, I noticed um, you earlier in your presentation, you showed uh, that other states that have enacted similar uh, restrictions to Minnesota. I know that there have been states that have actually had even more stringent restrictions in Minnesota and that those restrictions have gone on for an even longer period of time. I know in my conversations with the governor and uh, with uh, his team at MDH, um, that my understanding is that that was done because the, we really have put thought into that, uh, striking that balance of saving lives and, and keeping the economy open. So I guess my question is, you know, why, you know, why were there more states that had more stringent restrictions than us? And can you elaborate more on that balance between, you know, keeping our economy open and keeping Minnesotans safe. Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, you know, it's an excellent question. And um, in, as part of this response, the governor has honored um, different opinions and has fostered a, uh, a group who have been willing to share and have very difficult conversations with each other. Um, and uh, we have wrestled, we have wrestled every single day with 
striking the right balance in this pandemic. As you say, uh, there are many states that are much more stringent than Minnesota. I feel that the Minnesota approach has been successful. Um, if we look at a state like North Dakota and we look at their death rate, if we had had their death rate, over 4,000 more Minnesotans would be dead. We have protected and saved lives. At the same time, I believe we have struck an important balance. It's, um, you know, unfortunately, there is no playbook on how a pandemic is going to unfold. This is a brand new disease. We are only just now learning the disease. But by being science driven, by being nimble and flexible, um, we have been able to pivot as we need to. Um, and uh, I appreciate that the governor has always listened to the experts, has taken uh, different opinions into account in, in every one of his moves. Representative Balgamont, any more questions? No further questions, Mr. Chair. I just um, really want to thank you, Assistant Commissioner Huff, and applaud the work that you and everyone at MDH and the governor have done. The thoughtfulness that you put into striking that balance, uh, I think, is something that we should all be proud of. So thank you very much, Assistant Commissioner, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I have a few questions for um, Assistant Commissioner Huff, if I can proceed. Absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you. And I'm not sure what um, what slides maybe you need to go back to for this, but um, as you discussed uh, decision making and certain benchmarks on, uh, you know, closings of our economy um, and mask wearing, et cetera, I wonder if you could also uh, discuss then what are the benchmarks or the data points that you or the governor are looking for in order to uh, change those decisions. Uh, for example, getting you know businesses fully open, kids back in school. Um, what, what's the other side of the coin there? Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Haley. And Mr. Chair, with your permission, if the administrator could go to slide 15. Mr. Worth. Thank you, Mr. Worth. So uh, these are the dial back or public health risk measures that we have uh, published on the website. And these are updated right early. Um, now we have a lot of measures that we look at, but these we chose these specifically because they look at different parts of the, of the pandemic. Um, and you'll see here, uh, Representative, that we have, uh, I guess what you'd call like the green zone, which in this case is white, that's good. Um, yellow is our caution zone and the red is the high risk zone. Um, we want to be in the white um, area for all of these measures. Um, and that says that we are managing, that the pandemic is managed um, and that we are at a, at a good place in Minnesota. And you'll see that we are not there. We are still um, very high in, in some of these areas. We have been improving thanks to the good hard work of all of Minnesotans, we are improving. Um, but the other thing that we, we need to look at is uh, herd immunity. Um, and herd immunity can occur in one of two ways. One, it occurs when someone is infected and then survives the disease um, and recovers uh, and they have antibodies or immunity. And the other is through vaccine. So vaccination is the, the end game for this disease and this pandemic. Um, and uh, just because of limitations in supply, um, we are unfortunately in this for a while. The more vaccines that we get out there, the more herd immunity, obviously, the better off we're going to be. And we are going to see these risk measures move more into the white category. Thank you. Representative Haley. Assistant Commissioner Huff, so based on your experience in managing this pandemic to this point, can you anticipate when you think we will have a vaccination rate that brings us to herd immunity? Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Haley, that is 100% dependent upon how much vaccine we get in the state. Um, you know, right now we are receiving 60,000 doses a week at that rate it would take three and a half years to vaccinate every Minnesotan twice. Um, we do know that more vaccines are coming online. We do know that we now have a national plan for vaccination and for uh, addressing COVID. Um, it is our anticipation, it is our great hope 
um, that that distribution rate will increase dramatically so that we can um, vaccinate much more quickly. We are prepared as we have our pilot sites right now um, in the state, we are prepared to dramatically ramp up our vaccination rate as we receive vaccines from the federal government. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I could have a lot of follow-up to that one, but um, I'll leave that for another uh, discussion or, or later today. But I'd like to switch to another area that I had questions on, and I did make a note on this. I think this may have been your slide 19. And this was related to uh, your discussion about balancing. I'll wait until that's up here. Uh, yes. Um, and, and Mr. Huff, I have uh, said all along as we've been managing this pandemic that my goal as a legislator and serving my constituents was always has always been to balance um, public health and to balance the other impacts that this pandemic is having on our lives and on our economy. Um, and when you talked about this, you referenced that your decision-making has um, uh, been an attempt to balance this. Um, my concern is that we have not seen discussion uh, from the administration on the other impacts, nor have we seen data points um, that show that we are considering, for example, uh, businesses that have closed, people that have lost their entire livelihoods, um, the increase in suicides and depressions, the increase in other health issues when people haven't sought uh, medical care in time, the learning loss. And you particularly, when this discussion as well mentioned, um, the lens of dealing with uh, the disparities as this uh, pandemic has, has uh, you know, been across our country. Um, and we know for a fact children staying home from school is certainly having a great impact on everybody, but also increasing our uh, terrible achievement gap. So I, I'm wondering, uh, where is your data to look at these other impacts of the pandemic um, as we try to balance this decision making? Assistant Commissioner Hum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Haley. Um, I cannot speak for the economic data, but Commissioner Grove um, does track that. He reports that out to the governor every single day. Um, and uh, I know that we look at uh, you know, UI benefits, we look at um, the economic growth within each of the various sectors, jobless rates within the various sectors, number of businesses closing or opening. Um, so Commissioner Grove has definitely um, been tracking that, and the governor um, uh, is apprised of that every single day. Um, likewise, we look at impact on vulnerable populations as we go back to, and I'm wondering even if um, we could go back to one of Director Kelly's slides as we look at the structure. I think it may have been slide two, three, slide three. If we look at the structure here, each one of those boxes actually represents a different, or you'll see up in the yellow, a different work group. So we have a, a work group that is focused on education and child care. We have a work group that is focused on um, uh, worker protection, unemployment. We have a, a work group that's per, on uh, vulnerable populations, uh, including long-term care and people experiencing homelessness. So we have actually dedicated work groups that are all data-driven. Um, I don't have the data on them, but I know I, I get to hear at the morning briefing every day, they report their progress to the governor. And so um, I will say that every part of this response and all of those other things that you just mentioned have definitely been one tracked, reported, and acted upon and managed um, to the point where we have an individual work group focused on every single one of those issues that you just brought up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Huff. Um, I appreciate your response, but I, I, I guess my rebuttal to that and my concern with that is that our constituents 
uh, do not feel like they have a voice in these decisions. You may have work groups, um, et cetera, and I'm not gonna debate that with you today. But I think the question going back to even uh, Representative Garofalo's statement is um, our, our goal here is to figure out when the legislature that represents our constituents uh, has a more significant role in making these decisions. Um, and it's, it's concerning to, um, I think, most of us, uh, the rate of getting these vaccinations out uh, so that we can reach some herd immunity. And your, your statistic on our current rate would take us three and a half years. I can't imagine us being under executive powers and emergency powers for three and a half years. Um, so we, uh, as a bipartisan team here, I think need to figure out how to have more folks at the table so that our constituents' voices are heard in this process. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation today. Representative Liz Lagarde. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm just gonna open up and say that it's no, uh, it's no secret that, um, that I voted uh, seven consecutive times in the special sessions to take up the governor's power. And it's no disrespect, and it's not to say that there isn't an emergency before us. But I was voted in to represent 40,000 people in my district and to Representative Haley's point, I don't believe that their voice was, was heard. Um, there was no access. And to Representative Garofalo's point is, I asked to be on this committee because I believe this committee does need to have um, full transparency, dig into it and have that dialogue with the administration. Um, when does this end? There's an expectation that as the numbers go down, restrictions start to, to loosen. This cannot be a, um, an almighty grab power. And I'm not saying, suggesting that the governor has done that. He's done, I mean, he, I believe he has saved lives. But at what point is it no longer an emergency? I can tell you, you said three years, if that was the case, uh, 60,000 um, um, per month, I ain't gonna support three years of emergency powers and executive powers. And the dialogue that about where these decisions are being made. I, I mean, I don't understand why a professional athletes, uh, college athletes on the basketball court don't have to wear masks, but ho high school hockey and uh, high school basketball players, but then high school wrestlers don't. You know, if it's truly about the health, that's the stuff that I need to be uh, engaged in and have the voice heard from my district. Because as we sit in these committee meetings and, and we're having this discussion and we learn, and your presentation was incredible, um, Mr. Huff, and there's a lot of good information and you have more information <coughs> than, than we have. But our voice needs to be heard and we need to have that dialogue. The worst thing for me is to have access to a meeting uh, uh, two hours before, but yet I go on, uh, on, on KSTP and everything's already been leaked and my, my constituents are turning around and calling me and I'm trying to go through my email to see if I was sent that information. And so at some point this starts to, this has to unwind. And I'm on this committee, I asked to be on this committee because we have to have these serious discussions to start to unwind this. And I look forward to working with everyone. This all or nothing approach by this far extreme people that think just get rid of it all, those are extreme people. And that's not where I'm at. I believe that certain powers need to stay in place. I wanna learn about that more, but we do have to find how to open things up and let people move forward. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Huff, do you wish to respond? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative. I think that those are um, uh, points really well taken. And, you know, I, I would uh, point back to the governor's letter. Uh, I think the governor is very anxious to engage with the legislature um, uh, from an agency perspective. Um, we do value and need your input. Um, if, if we're to get through this as a state, um, I think the governor is the first to say we need to work together as a state. And so um, I would I would just uh, uh, want to highlight the governor's letter to that effect. 
Um, and I'm happy, you know, if if you'd like me to dive uh, in deeper detail onto masking or on the youth sports masking, more than happy to do that um, or any other parts there as well. Thank you. Representative Blusigard, you will wish for follow up? No, I just I look forward to the dialogue that this committee uh, is going to have moving forward, the robust conversation and the engagement. Thank you. All right. Before I go to uh, Representative O'Neill, this committee is going to have to end at 235. It is my intention a week from today to have another hearing and to pick up where we left off on this agenda, and we will likely be adding more to the agenda. So with that, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you having this committee. I appreciate this very much because it's been 11 months, and this is the first time that the legislature has engaged in this way. We're a divided legislature. We're the only divided legislature in the entire country. And it is even more so important that the legislature return to co-equal branches of government. We have three branches of government. We don't have two. And the legislature needs its power back, to be quite honest. Um, in regards to the vaccine, it, there's only 40% of the vaccine has even been distributed the distribution has been problematic. And I'll leave it at that. I want to, in, I want to um, present something for your consideration and maybe the administration has not seen this yet because it was first published on January the 5th um, by the European Journal of Clinical Investigation. It's a Stanford study and it's titled Assessing mandatory stay at home and business closure effect on the spread of COVID-19. Now it's a brand new study, it's been pre-reviewed. It has an entire team of people, um, Department of Medicine, Department of Health Policy, Epidemiology, Biomedical Data, Statistics, uh, Metadata Research, or just a few of the departments that weighed in on this particular study. The study was conducted <clears throat> in 10 countries, England, France, Germany, Iran, Italy, nor the North, excuse me, the Netherlands, Spain, South Korea, Sweden, and the United States. And they did a metadata analysis of the effects. The most egregious, if you are a civil rights person and care about people's liberties, most egregious effects upon the society, which were the stay at home orders and the business closures versus the more minimal effects, um, the less restrictive. So they have more restrictive, like the business closures and less restrictive, and they put them on a continuum. And I'll just tell you what their conclusion was for the sake of time. Well, small benefits cannot be excluded. We cannot find significant benefits on a case growth of more restrictive non-pharmaceutical interventions, similar reductions in case growth may be achieved with less restrictive interventions. So they're basically saying the higher the restriction, the there's no bang for the buck. Um, but on the converse of that, which is what Representative Haley said, is that the potential health harms are quite great, including hunger, opioid related overdoses, mixed vaccina missed vaccinations, increased disease from missed health services, domestic abuse, mental health, and suicide, uh, as well as a whole host of economic impacts. So I would submit this to you. I told you already where it came from, that I'd ask that you would take a look at this study and uh, review that. It's brand new, and it basically says stay-at-home orders and business closures have minimal or no effect or a negative effect on the spread of COVID and the overall health of a society, including the economic impacts. So I look forward to returning to a co-equal branch and that should be the number one consideration of this committee in my estimation. Thank you for the sake of time, I appreciate it. That's all I have to say, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, I uh, have uh, the time is 2.33 and this committee has to end at 2.35. So Representative Sandstead, I'm going to bring you up next, and then we are going to continue exactly where we left off a week from now and alert everyone who's on the agenda that uh, we would like to have them back. So Representative Sandstead, you've got about two minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will keep this brief. I just really wanted to reiterate something that Representative O'Neill said. And um, I want to thank the presenters today for their work. I thought it was very thorough, very good. But this is the first time that we've been together. And for people who are listening in the general public, it is really important that they understand that during special session, members of either side found it very difficult to bring any issues forth unless there was five-way agreement between leadership. And um, it's good to be back in session. It's good to have committee process where we can hear from the public and we can have a thorough debate. And as one of my esteemed colleagues used to say, or still says, there is nothing special about a special session. And so I'm glad to be back in regular session and doing this work. And I, I do look forward to working with my colleagues to find a path forward for all of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, we are we are at our allotted time. Mr. Chairman. Going, yeah, Representative Doubt, but be brief, please. I apologize. Just as the minority lead, there's a couple of things that I think we have to at least uh, outline in the first session. Um, and they're just questions I have for you. Can you outline uh, what the scope of this committee is going to be? Uh, I see it as a short-term problem of the emergency powers immediately that are in effect, and then a long-term rewrite of Chapter 12. Um, is that what you anticipate? And then I'd like to know what we can expect for a timeline on both of those things. I really have a fear that uh, businesses are going to start ignoring the emergency powers or the emergency orders that are in place. Um, and I don't think anybody wants to see that. Representative Doubt, that's exactly uh, my position of this committee, that we're going to do at least a review of those two executive orders that we have on the agenda. And then once we are done with those to proceed to However, we can come to a compromise on chapter 12, and I would like to build that in this committee through a series of uh, drafts so that we wouldn't have one bill before us, but we would have multiple things before us drafting that we could come to an agreement on. And I'm being told we're, we're out of time, but I think uh, you and I agree exactly where this is going to go. Thank you. Thank you. Members, I want to thank everyone, and I would hope that those uh, members from the governor's office will return, and then we'll work on a little broader agenda for next week. Thank you, everyone. I think it's a good start. And with that, meeting is adjourned.